All right. Good morning. Oh, I was pitiful. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for turning my mic on, sir. I appreciate you. I'm going to try again. I tend to be, you know, everybody says they're different. And then we all end up, like, sort of standing up here like Charlie Brown. You know, you know uh, I'm going to date myself. I'm Janet Bueller. Bueller. Right? But I don't want to do that to you. So I try to be a little more interactive. So I'm going to invite you at 8.30 in the morning. I'm looking for a special guest. She's not here yet. I have a family member who's going to show up. Um, and I'll introduce her when she gets here. She didn't embarrass her, but I don't see her. So anyway, um, I'm going to try to keep us on time. I like interaction because I remember, and I, I say remember, like I'm going to have to do sit in grand rounds or sit in a lecture in about a week. And my prayer is always, please let them be interactive, right? Because if I have to sit, it's just to sit there and watch somebody for an hour, right? And it's, we do it at 4 o'clock. And, uh, you know, I'm at Georgetown, so the difference between leaving at 4.58 and 5.01, right, is, is like a 20, 25 minute difference between when I get home, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my God, I want to go, I'm ready to go, but I can't because the chair sits right down at the front, right? So I can't sneak out. And he, and he sits on purpose. He kind of sits like this, right? So we're all here. So if you get up. He's going to catch you, right? So you can't see how. So I say all of that to say I try to make this a little more engaging, try to make it a little more fun, if fun is the right word, because I know how difficult it is to sit and listen to somebody talk about stuff when a lot of times you don't want to hear what they're talking about and you have other stuff you could be doing. Right? So in that spirit, when I, when I start or at some point in all of my presentations, I do a lot of talks. A lot of them are with community members. And so today, you all are going to be like community members, right? You are parts of communities, but you're clinicians, you're researchers, you're providers, your staff, you're experts in your field. But today, we're going to treat you like you're like all the rest of us, like regular folk. Um, and with regular folk, what I try to do is I try to leave them with something that will be useful for them when they're away from me. I happen to be big on mindfulness. Anybody self-practice mindfulness? Yeah. Oh, oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, so we're going to start with a little mindfulness exercise. Do not judge me, mindfulness people, okay? This is probably not a good mindfulness exercise, but we're going to start with mindfulness. All right, so what I'm going to ask you to do, really quickly and really briefly, I'm going to invite you, because I was chastised for saying everybody, literally this happened. I said everybody close your eyes and the person got mad at me and let me know at the end, right? They felt pressured to close their eyes. Okay? <laughs> so now I'm going to invite you. I have learned my lesson. All right, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes, sit up straight, put your hands on your lap or on the desk. Ooh, so compliant. I love being in, in school because everybody, everybody does what you say. All right, so you, I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes, rest your hands gently, and we're going to take as long as I say. You're going to listen to my voice. While I'm talking, your eyes are closed, and all you're doing is breathing, right? And as you're breathing, all you're doing is counting the time it takes you to breathe in, and then the time it takes you to breathe out. For most people, that's somewhere between three and four, a count of three or four. All right, so I'm going to invite you to do that now. And when I say stop, you're going to stop. And I'm going to, stop, and I'm going to do the same thing with you. So I'm going to invite you to start now, and I'm going to be quiet. Okay, stop and open your eyes. Now, why do I do that? I do that because it helps me calm my nerves. Well, why do I tell people I do that? I tell them that I'm teaching them something, right? So it's like I'm killing two birds with one stone, right? So I appreciate you indulging me. Now, with all of that, another way that I always start is I ask everybody to say good morning, right? But we're going to do a little twist because we are in San Francisco. We have so much wonderful diversity. We're going to celebrate it. Right, so I'm going to say good morning to you, and then whatever language you want to say good morning back to me, I want you to say it nice and loud on the count of three. All right, so I'm saying good morning to you. Good morning. One, two, three. Oh, that was awesome. That was awesome. I heard some Spanish down here. Any Tagalog? Como está acá? No. No Tagalog. Okay, any French? Bonjour. No? No French? Okay, I'm working on my French on Pimsleur, so I want to try to practice a little bit. All right, so with that. 
I'm going to get started. Um, so my name is Alfie Breland Noble. I go by Dr. Alfie because I work with young people, and I promised myself I wasn't going to stand behind this thing. Um, I work with young people, and they don't want to say Breland Noble because it's too much of a mouthful. So I go by Dr. Alfie. All right? And you see my tagline is Love, Life, Science, which I already told you I'm a little different because I'm an academic. You know, we don't talk about things like love. That's not something that we do. That We don't do that. I think they beat it out of us when we were in graduate and med school. But in any event, um, for me, this work really is a passion. And so as I talk, what I hope you will hear is this process, two things, two or three things. One is, yes, there's data. Okay, I'm just going to say that there's data. It's at the end, but there's data. Because um, I know, I know, if I go through this talk and I don't give you any data, you're like, what in the world? And y'all going to beat up on Dr. McQuaid and I don't want my friend to get in trouble. So yes, I have data. <laughs> All right, so the other thing is I feel like it's important for me to say clearly I am a woman of color, clearly, right? That's no surprise to anybody. I identify as African American. And I'm going to show you some stats from the AAMC that talk about sort of where people like me sit within this space, right? Why is that important? Because I think people need to know. So for each of us, there's some part of our identity that is not always necessarily they're not, well, other folks, we, at UCSF, all of our identities all the time probably feel 100% supported. But for those other folks, okay, for those other, oh, okay, they, all right, tell Tube, look, tell Tube this morning, okay. So for those other folks, there are parts of our identity that don't feel celebrated, don't feel valued, don't feel welcome. I think it's important, particularly for trainees, particularly for women, particularly for LGBTQ folks, particularly for people of color, to have acknowledgement that all parts of who you are are not always celebrated in these spaces. We have to acknowledge that. That's a part of our work. That's a part of what it means to be who we are. And I can recall nobody saying that to me. Right? And so when I started encountering this, I was like, well, what is this? Why am I having a hard time? Why are my classmates getting, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, 25 publications before the first K Award, and I have five. Well, there's a reason for that. It's called sponsorship, not mentoring. Right? It's because they were on grants or on R01 as co-investigators with their mentors who supported them. Right? And so it's not a fault if you don't have 25. You've got to be honest. You've got to look at what is going on in the environment. Right? So I tend to be one of those people. I like to think of myself somebody who tells the truth. I like to think of myself that way. I don't know if that's accurate. I am high strung now. I know that's true about me. Um, <laughs> But I want to talk about all of those things, all right? And then we're going to also talk about this process, really the whole focus of why we're here. All right, the other thing I will say is um, thank you. Gracias. Wait a minute. Now, you think I would know this. Merci. Lord have mercy. It took me all that to get the merci. Um, and salamat. Right? Because if people like John, who is not a person of color, don't invite me, I don't get an opportunity to do this kind of stuff with you all which means trainees who are young people of color don't get an opportunity to see somebody like me. All right? So I have to say thank you. And then there were a lot of people who went into making all this work possible. You will see names and hear different things, and then when my cousin comes, I'm going to embarrass her. <laughs> all right, so have you had your coffee yet? We're going to do, I told you I like to be a little more interactive and have a little bit of dialogue. All right, so if you're in clinic, you have a clinic here. We're going to talk about young people, so child and adolescent clinic. Right? And we're going to act like the clinic at UCSF, I know you have multiple, represents 100% of the U.S. population of children, adolescents, and youth. All right? So just bear with me. All right? So you statisticians, don't beat me up. You just, this is a, a thought exercise. All right? So if, I want you to tell me, what proportion, now think about in the clinics where you work, those of you who work with children and adolescents, anybody under 18, what percent or what proportion of the patients who come into the clinics at UCSF would you say are Latino, Latinx? 10, 15, 20, 5, 2, 50? 15. 15. Okay, about 15. Asian or Asian American? 30. Oh, a lot. Okay, that's big. Okay. Somebody said maybe not. Depends on the clinic. Okay, so it varies. All right. Depends on the campus? Okay, so it varies. All right. So in any one of the clinics, would you say that the number or the proportion of young people of color who come into those clinics reflects the proportion of kids with need in the community? No. Okay. That's the thought exercise. Right. 
right, y'all made it real easy. All right, so that's the whole point. So I did a little, we'll skip it. I did some calculations, but you already said it depends on the clinic. I'm thinking like one or two clinics. I'm not thinking a whole bunch of clinics. Right, so you made my point. You all probably felt fair better than most other places, right? So at Georgetown in clinic, when I'm in clinic, I'm in clinic like half a day a week. I'm just thinking about the clinic when I walk in the door. Who do I see sitting in the lobby? I don't see all that. Right? That's my experience in, in D.C., which is what, about 40, 45% African American? They're not coming in the clinic. And when they are coming, this is who they're coming to see. And how do they find me? They get on the website. My last name begins with the B. They start scrolling. And it's not just the black folks. I'm the first brown face they see, so they call that's how people find me, right? That's why it's important for those of us who represent different identities to be in these spaces. You may be the reason that somebody decides they're going to come in. Because there's something about you on that profile, something about you in that picture, something about the words that are next to your name that's going to make somebody say, okay, let me try. All right? So, um, who's missing from that? All right? Even when I get all the black folks I'm still not getting the full representation, I'm thinking about the Georgetown Clinic, of that population because it's not socioeconomically diverse. Right? There's, there's, I want to just give folks a little hint. Y'all already know this, but I'm going to say it for the people in somewhere else out there who don't know. All black people are not poor. That is a segment of the African American population. It's not the whole, it doesn't mean that it's not an important part of the population, but it's a segment. My classmate is on a show that I think is far more reflective, not all, of many of the people I grew up with, they're not blackish. Anthony Anderson was my classmate at Howard, and I'm a Howard grad. So Puffy was my classmate at Howard, right? And they, they say Empire is a cross between King Lear and Puffy. I think that's probably accurate, <laughs> right? Um, but those are folks I went to school with. Now, Puffy didn't come from anything, not a lot, but he has a lot now. And so all of that diversity, I feel like, is important, but that's not what we see in our literature. All right, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but it's just to make that point. All right, so why is it important for us to look at this within group diversity? Well, Dr. McQuaid and I are on a committee together, and we looked, and we looked at all the literature. We had a lot of parameters we had to work with them, but we could not identify a single randomized control trial that had large enough samples, right? I don't know one that exists for Asian, Asian American youth. Right? For Latino youth, there's two or three. Two or four, one is focused on uh, interpersonal therapy, IPT. Two are focused on CBT. They're older. Right? But even within those, the Latino youth are not socioeconomically diverse. In the IPT study, those kids are all under-resourced kids. Right? So what we have is a knowledge about segments of these populations. What we don't have is a knowledge about the totality of the population which is very different than, I think, from what we know about young white youth. I worked on the Treatment of Adolescent Depression Study, TADS. That, we had 11 sites. The vast majority of the kids in that study were white, and they came from varied socioeconomic backgrounds. Right? The black kids in that study, the Latino kids, not so much. Right? So all of this is to say this is important because we want to be able to deal with everybody. So yeah, I have, a, I have a, my own clinic. This is my, I'm just, was picking a snapshot of what's in my clinic, like, in the last three months. That's what's in my clinic. Right? So I won't read it, because everybody in here can read, but that's diversity within group. Right? Right now I have two Nigerian patients. That's a different experience than my experience as an African American woman, which they, you know, take no, they don't spare me by telling me that. Regularly. <laughs> I, I hear it a lot. <laughs> okay, so there's very little to this. I had to find a way to stick my book in here, right? So this is my book. All right, got the women, we got to do some self promotion. Okay, but there is very little literature. There's very little I can consult to find what I need for these folks. Right? That's just one resource. That's not all of it. So it's just to say that this stuff is important. And I'm going to skip this because usually when I did, when I say this, I've said something at this point that somebody didn't know. I say I won't. By show of hands, have you heard anything so far?
that's new for you, that's new information. Okay, a couple folks. Thank you for being honest. Okay, fantastic. And I'm going to get to that because I want to finish and I'll save questions to the end. So part two. Remember I told you it's going to be two or three parts. Pecori funds my work. Many people in here know Pecori. As a matter of fact, there's a colleague of yours. I don't want to say his last name. Dr. Tung. He's awesome. He and I, I probably shouldn't say this. I hope you're not watching, Dr. Tung, you're listening. But when we were on the Pecori Adjustment Disparities Advisory Board, we'd be sitting beside each other causing trouble. Right, because we're like, we just were on the same page, talking about diversity, talking about the lack of diversity, talking about why this stuff is important, talking about the lack of representation um, in studies where people don't disaggregate within groups. It's a whole lot of groups under the label Asian, and they're very, very different. You know, we had those times, we'd be like cutting eyes at each other. They would just say Asian, we were like, well, what does that mean? Were they Korean? Were they Japanese? Were they Filipino? Were they Vietnamese? Were they Hmong? What? Nobody knows because nobody asks. And so I feel like Pecori is one of those places where they at least try to get it right, and that's who's funded my work. All right, so that's just to say I've had that funding, and I feel like Pecori, they really are research done differently because I feel like I had this body of work that I was engaged in, and then Pecori came along and sort of put a stamp on it and said, you know what? That kind of stuff that you do, that's fundable. I didn't have to like, twist myself into a pretzel trying to help other folks, funders that will remain nameless because I'm still probably going to try to get some money out of them, <laughs> um, uh, why this work is important and why the approach to the work is important. And as I go through it, I think you'll understand why the work looks a little different than what folks may be used to. So my work is culturally relevant. It is engaged. It's patient-centered. I am all about disparities and equity. That's me. Um, and I do blend, you know, I have a master's in clinical trials from Duke, so I know traditional clinical trials methodology. I've worked on trials, right? Why do I say that? Because sometimes people think when I say I do uh, mixed methods and CBPR, they think I don't know the other stuff. Yeah, I do. Right? And it's okay to say that. So all of this together for my work leads me to believe that my work is rigorous. All right? And so what do I base my assumptions on about the rigor of my work, whether it's my professional experience, my lived experience, and they're sort of the tools of the trade. So if you have a cell phone and you're under 40, I'll, I'll say it like that. If you're a young person, yeah, if you're a young person or you identify as a young person, let me just leave it there. <laughs> um, I don't mind cell phones being out taking pictures, right? Because this is how people who I work with, this is how they, this is how they see my work. Like Twitter, and, I mean, I hate to say it, Twitter and Instagram. Now, I have not gotten out. So my young millennials, I know there's no Snapchat up here. I get it. I have not figured out how to use Snapchat, and I'm not sure I want to learn. So <laughs> Twitter and Instagram are my spots, okay? Now, I don't mind phones being out, because when you take pictures and you put it out, that's encouraging somebody to look into this work. I've had lots of opportunities. I take the PBS special last week. Um, I was on PBS and NBC Nightly News in one, that was a good week. Uh, in the same week, it was bookends of one week, because they found me on Twitter. Right? And why did they find me? They didn't find me for fluff. They found me talking about my research. Right? So when I started years ago, I can remember, in 2011, I was sitting in a meeting, and it was a young Asian brother. He was talking about his blog. He was a junior faculty member. And in my mind, I'm thinking, child, you are never going to get tenured with a blog. What are you doing? Wasting your time on a blog. Right? Man, guess what? I have a blog. <laughs> right? So he was way ahead of me. But I think for the work that we do, if we don't find a way to communicate it to the people we're trying to reach, it's not going to benefit. What good is it for us to do randomized control? And I'm not saying they're bad. But what good is it for us to do RCTs? to benefit people, and then we don't have a way to communicate to people how what we're doing benefits them. I'm not saying this is the only way. It's one tool. But for the population I want to reach, that's where these kids are going to get this information. All right. So, tools of the trade. I have to acknowledge my mama. I wish my cousin was here, right? You see, 2006, she passed away. Uh, but mom was the person who, when I was writing my K, I put it in three times. All right, so anybody writing a K, where she at? I'm talking to you. I can't find you, but I'm talking to you. Anybody writing a K? Oh, there she is, my sister. Keep putting it back in. All right, don't let anybody sell you. Those, oh, I only wrote my K one time, and they got funded on the first try. They're lying. <laughs> it may have been funded the first time they actually submitted it, but they sort of 
kind of, sort of submitted it without officially submitting it multiple times before they put it in the first time. All right? So don't, don't fall for that. Okay. And she was the person who read my K. Two o'clock in the morning, she's like, baby, I have no idea what this is saying, but you go. I know you're going to be fine. <laughs> right? Everybody needs that person. All right. These other folks, the, the one thing, this is all my family. Spouse, kiddos a long time ago, my nephew who's at Cal State Fullerton, my dad and my brother. But the most important part of this slide to me is this part right here. This says January 22nd, 1958. This letter is to certify that you are eligible to return and register as a graduate student in the field of education in the summer session of 1958. That's Flora P. McLeod, that's my grandma. 1958 at Northwestern. So you talk about tools of the trade, that's my tool. If that woman in 1958 from rural Mississippi could leave four kids, 17 to age 11, go away from her husband with a eighth grade education, leave him with the kids, and go get that master's degree, I cannot whine when I get that low score on the Pecori Award and have to put it back in. All right? Tools of the trade. All right? This is why I do what I do. All right, so for me, I feel like, just like grandmother, she had to chart that path in 1958, and she told me, she said, baby, it was two of us. It was me and a prick that he came in. We held on to each other for dear life to get through that master's program. They pulled each other through that, but they were only two people of color in the whole cohort, and they helped each other. All right, so this, remember I said I was going to tell you about where we sit? Ah, that would be me. Okay, now maybe the data is updated since 2015. I have not looked at it again. But I'm sure it's not that much different. All right? This, you need to see this. Right? It's not that different across racial ethnic groups. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm focusing on the African American part. All right? This, the percent of African American women faculty as a subset of all faculty in U.S. medical schools. That's ridiculous. All right? So if you go in a room, there's 100 people, it's going to be me and my cousin who's biracial. That's it. We're the only one going to be in there. Okay? Funding. Look at that. So when you're sitting and struggling with why can I get this all one funded, you have to understand you're not alone. There's a whole lot of us. It's 99, 98% of us can't get it funded. Okay. You have to know, it's not to tell you don't do it, it's to put it in context so you don't feel like you're the only one. Like the numbers don't look too much different for other race and ethnic groups. All right. Okay. All right. So why bother? This is why I bother. I feel like this is important. I feel like I'm talking to the trainees. Everybody has a calling. I know what mine is. You have a vision. That's yours. It's not supposed to be anybody else's. When I first started, and I said, uh, I'm going to say the acronym, uh, ACOMA. Right, it's the West African Adinkra symbol. It's supposed to be Akoma, but I changed it to fit my purposes. So it's Akoma. Um, I remember sitting in the lab with a bunch of colleagues, and they were laughing. They are like, no, oh, Akoma? We you talking about putting people in a coma? And they thought that was fun. It was a corny joke, but that's what they said, right? But that doesn't mean you stop. Right? Everybody here has a vision for something that they want in their academic career or in their clinical career, right, or in their training career. If you have a vision, that vision is yours, and you don't let anybody take you off of it. Okay, now, you may have to take some steps back. I had to do that. I went from my first tenure track appointment to a postdoc because I wanted to be a researcher. Right? I wanted to go into academic medicine. I didn't start in academic medicine. That's okay. That was my path. I'm not telling anybody to do that, so don't hear me say that. All right? But that was my path. Right? Another thing is every young person deserves to see the possibilities for in my case, mental health and who can help you take care of your mental health, right? So we're going to go into the research a little bit. I want you to shift your thinking a little and recognize that there are multiple ways of knowing and there are multiple types of outcomes. All of our outcomes in mental health do not have to be measured. I'm not saying it's bad because there's a place for it. The Beck Anxiety Inventory, the Beck Depression Inventory, PHQ-9, those are important, but those aren't the only outcomes. There are other outcomes that are important to us, right? So I just want us to have a hat on where we're thinking about these multiple ways of knowing and different ways to examine outcomes. So here's our goal. By the end of this, my hope is that you can examine or articulate some of these barriers, not the money. It's not the money. 
Right, here's a tip. If you take nothing else away from here today, for many black folks, money is not the issue about why they don't get care. It is one. It's not the only one. Latinos as well. It's not just money. People don't want to sit in our offices. Right? Because it's this big, scary word that nobody wants attached to them called crazy. Nobody wants it. Right? So when we talk about this thing, mama just won't accept this, that came from one of our studies. There was a, actually a woman who said this in uh, one of the focus groups. And what she said was, I'm already black. I'm already a woman. I do not also need to be crazy. Right? And so we went on talking. We talked about a young person. Uh, one of the women in the group was talking about how this child clearly was demonstrating signs of bipolar disorder. So they went to the clinic. The clinic did not have racially diverse staff. They gave the child a diagnosis. This child was like 18, 17, 18 years, like right on the cusp of being able to make her own decisions. Gave her meds. They got home. What did mama do? Mama just won't accept it. She said, baby, you don't need that. That's white people stuff. Stop taking those meds. And she stopped taking the meds and started spiraling. Right? So when we talk about it, I want to be, I try to be clear about this is not all communities, it's not every person, but there's this stigma attached to what we do in the area of mental health that is real for communities of color. Because people who are already feeling marginalized do not need another thing to make them feel more marginalized. Right? And nothing, I don't think, I can't think of too many things, there are a couple diseases that are highly stigmatized. Mental illness is highly stigmatized. Right? So part of what we're going to do is talk a little bit about some of the research we've done and how we try to work around some of those barriers. Um, the practical application of some of the theoretical approaches to community and patient engagement. We're going to talk about patient-centered outcomes research, comparative effectiveness research, and community-based participatory research is what we try to blend in my lab. And then look at measurable outcomes of effective, remember I said look at different kinds of outcomes, effective community and patient engagement. All right. So my, I feel like my role, remember how I said you chart a path, grandmother charted, she cut the path for me. I cut a little bit for somebody else. And my hope is that the trainees who come behind me will cut the path and make it even more clear for people who are coming behind them. All right. So this is my lab. These are examples of my lab. So as you can see, we try to have... Diversity. Now, people look at a picture like this and they say, well, that's not diverse. Well, it is. Right? Besides the fact this is a young Asian American sister who is now getting a PhD out here at UCLA. I'm very proud of Michelle. She was awesome. These three young ladies are all from the Caribbean. So we're all black, but we're not all African American. And that's important um, because this young this sister is from St. Lucia. She's in school at... Uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical School right now. <clears throat> and this sister is a graduate student working on a PhD, working on the Jackson Heart Study uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, one of the largest, probably the largest longitudinal study uh, of cardiovascular disease. A lot of people are familiar with it uh, among African Americans. Um, but the point is, is that when we go out to talk with young people, this sister is Latina. Right? She looks black, but she's Latina. And so what's important for us is that when kids, we're sort of priming kids. When my team goes out and they see all of that, I think it makes it maybe this much easier for them to consider that there are people who don't look like them who will be willing to help them. But if my team, everybody looks like me, it's a little bit of a harder sell. And this right here, sister, this is a community person who I'll talk about in a little bit, in a minute. All right. So I had a K. Here's stuff from the K. I just want to make sure I acknowledge right, so right, I had a K. We had 15 publications from the K. Let me just say that and get it out of the way. All right, so that was the K, and here's some of the findings. All right, so what did we learn? I think the most important thing we learned from early efforts, right, this is sort of the background of how we built what we do, is this piece. This is not where we started, faith-based mental health promotion. That's, that's where we ended up. That was not my intent. My intent was it, for it to be community engaged. Well, the community ended up being black churches. Okay. So that was one of the most important things that came out of the work, and that sort of sets the stage for going forward, the kind of work that we do right now. All right. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it to work. I wanted her to talk. Maybe she's not going to talk. 
I'm, I'm looking for a pastor who is interested in working as a community partner with the project that she was working on. And so I responded to the flyer who I very much interested in mental health in our neighborhoods. I, I'm very conscious of the fact that trauma is very real in the neighborhoods that I serve. It says that I, um, I am actually the founder of Down for Life Ministries, that is the long stand for LLC, and that gives me an opportunity to use resources to help people in a way that I can't as a United Methodist pastor, because as a United Methodist pastor, there are a lot of um, account there's accountability, which is a good thing. But it also takes time. And when you find yourself in a situation where things need to happen fast, you need to have a group of people that you can rely on, you can go to in a quick way. My background, I, I, um, I actually have a, a doctorate in the doctor ministry from West Philadelphia Seminaries. My focus was on urban ministry. I was in the inaugural class that studied or, or that started that doctoral program. Um, when Dr. Alfie asked me to join her today, it was a couple of months ago, and my first reaction was, she asked me, and I said, yes. You know, and then I thought about it, because I think about what I see on all the doctor shows and these things, and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. And she asked me, she said, bring some slides. And I started thinking about some slides that I could put together that were really, really, really academic and, you know, and try to impress you all. And, and it brought me anxiety that I didn't necessarily need, because I realized I could best show you and, and serve the community that I represent by just being who I am and showing you what I do. And what I tell Dr. Alfie often is um, what I'll to speak from my heart and my mind and then you add all the bigger words. <laughs> so that's what I'm asking you to do this afternoon. I'm just going to share from my heart and my mind and then you just add all the big 10 dollars 20 letter words that you all use that I don't usually understand. Is that okay? That's all right. Yeah. All right, so who was that? That woman was named, her name is Reverend Dr. Jaylene Chase Sands. And Dr. Chase Sands and I, she was a community partner, and as you heard her say, from the United Methodist Church. Church. So for me, there are a couple layers of cognitive dissonance, because I didn't know, I, I mean, I'm confessing, I did not realize that there were African Americans who belong in large numbers to the United Methodist Church. That was new for me, which shouldn't have been a surprise to me because, you know, I, I tease people and I say, when you see me, it's like seeing a lunar eclipse. You only see one every hundred or so years, I'm a black Catholic. <laughs> right? And then not a lot of us. Right? So I should have known as a black Catholic that there were, uh, you know, of course there are black people in other faith communities, but I'm used to sort of traditional Protestant black faith communities, uh, Baptists. I thought most black folks were Baptists. They, well, it turns out we're lots of different things. And so Reverend Dr. Jaylene Chase Sands and I work together. I'll show you some of the work that we've done. This is where I get into the data. Um, and our work really centers on this idea of faith-based mental health promotion. Now, where was she speaking? That was Grand Rounds at Georgetown. And I remember somebody came up to me, and I'm not sure how to take it still, at the end, and this is a colleague I've known a long time. And he says to me, yeah, wow, Alfie, that was, um, brave. And I thought, oh, I'm not sure I was supposed to think about that. So I think what he was saying was the fact that you would have a non-academic come into this space and speak to academics. I couldn't tell if brave meant brave or brave meant stupid, but so I'm going to go with brave. I'm going to go with brave meant brave, right? But the point was, I can't do what I do if Jeline doesn't do what she does. Right? And you'll see when I say outcomes, you'll see some of what Jolene was able to help us accomplish. But that was the grand round, and she was just speaking to how our, relate, our partnership started, and then she went on to talk about some of the work that we did together. And that work was PCORI funded work. And so why do I say this faith-based mental health piece is important uh, for the work that I do? Well, this right here. These two. Well, this one. Right? So most black people who go to church, if they go, go to predominantly black churches. Right? Even as a Catholic, surprise, my church is predominantly African American. It's also very international. And when I say predominantly, it's only about probably 55% African American. Um, the whole rest of the church, I think, I don't know if we're like a point of fascination. I don't know if in Europe, people go back and say, you got to go to this. It's a church and it's Catholic and it's all black people. you got to go when you go to D.C. <laughs> But literally every weekend we have people from all over Europe because we do this thing at the end where they say it's the preset stand. 
and introduce yourself. And these folks are literally from all over the world. Um, and that, like, every weekend, that's like half the church, half the service. But for most black people, most of blacks are Protestant, and that includes Caribbean and African immigrant blacks. Um, the church home they belong to is predominantly black. As well, 53 per, half of these folks saying they're going to church on a regular basis. Right? That's everybody from homeless family to the president of the university. And sometimes they're all in one church. Okay. And most black folks profess the salience of religion in their lives. There's one group that's higher, one ethnic group. Can y'all guess what group that is? Nobody wants to guess? Latinos. 80%. Right? So if you're going to try to get, remember I was talking about a cross section? You're going to catch them at church. Right? All right, so that's why we work in churches. All right, so El Pecori Project. I've already mentioned what these are. Everybody here already knows what they are, but this is what we try to focus on in our research, the work that we do. Right? We want it patient-centered. We do want to compare the effectiveness of treatments. Even though many of the treatments have not been tested on the population I serve, right? Not the full totality of the population. And it has to be community-based because I feel like if you build it, I'm about to say, rising tide lifts all boats. So if you can capture the people who are hardest to capture, I think you're going to get the other ones. You'll sweep the other ones up. And so it needs to be community-based because I need people to tell me what's going to, not only what's going to make this work, but what's going to make you use it. Right, so I figured it out. Figure it out. Are you going to use it? Are you going to benefit from it? Right? We believe in our field that cognitive behavioral therapy fixes everything. Right? We CBT with anxiety, CBT, trauma, CBT, right? Eat disorder, CBT. Like we think CBT, and I'm not saying anything wrong with CBT. I use CBT, but if I were to sit here and say I don't have to adapt it for my population, I would be lying. I have a wonderful colleague, she's Asian American, Doris Chang, New School for Social Research. She took the concept of Confucianism and took the principles and overlaid that with CBT. And guess what? It resonated with people and it worked. Right? Same concept, mindfulness. I might do this and say I'm in mountain pose, but for many African American, black folks, or Latino, that might be praying. If, that, if it's going to get you to do it, okay, we're just going to be praying today. Right? If that's what I have to communicate to you to get you to do something, take care of yourself, I'm okay with that. The principles are still the same. You're quiet, you're clear in your mind, you're focused on the present. Hopefully that's helping you reduce your anxiety. If you want to say that's prayer, I'm okay with that. Right? So it's this idea that if we can build it and contextualize it for the communities we work with, it can, I feel like it can work better. All right, so we had, I'm going to try to fly through this a little bit because I know I want to finish to give us time to honestly have a discussion. We had an engagement award. Here were the foci of our project. The goal, the outcome of this was to develop a training curriculum so we could train African Americans and black folks to be good partners, not just consumers, not just subjects, but partners with folks like you to develop comparative effectiveness research. What a novel idea. And people, and when I say you have a dream, you have a focus, you have to stay with it, people look at me like I had three heads. Well, those are complex concepts. How are you going to train people to do that? We did. You have to talk to people nice. You have to speak in a language that people understand, right? And you have to listen, right? And I'm going to own my stuff. I'm an academic. I'm not always a good listener. I like to hear myself talk. Not that anybody in here is surprised by that. Um, but I had to listen, right? And if we, in doing those things, we were able to develop this curriculum. All right. So what did we do? Remember how I said outcome? Fifteen faith communities across two states. Look how many people we engaged, collected data from. I don't know all lot of states with 200 black folks in them. The one that I can think of, the one. Uh, is these folks out on the West Coast, the collaborative care, one of those collaborative care studies. I, they, had, well, they had 200 subjects. I don't know if they had 200 African Americans. So I have to correct myself, right? These folks filled out surveys. We have lots of wonderful data. So yeah, 
If you want to do some long distance uh, data examination, call me. Um, we're sitting on this data. It's new data. Um, we did 17 focus groups. We had this measure. This measure is uh, from Canada, and it helps people assess what is their own personal capacity to engage in health promotion activities. Right? We have data from 40 people, about 40 people on that, and then we came up with this curriculum. All right, so who are our participants? 163 adults, 40 youth from these areas. I'm going to share with you basic demographic data, and then I'm going to tell you some outcomes from the, the study that we did to help us build the curriculum. All right, so you know what the purpose was. It's to build the curriculum to prepare African-American black churches to train people in how to understand patient-centered outcomes research, comparative effectiveness research, and community-based participatory research so that they are equipped and have the capacity to work with folks like us to do that kind of research. All right, so here's our breakdown. <clears throat> 113 female, 36 male, and our adults. As you can see, most of the folks identified as Baptist, you know, most of the folks identified as Christian, or well, we had a large percentage who identified as Christian specifically, and then these folks identified as Baptist. But generally, all these people, I think, would identify themselves as Christian. All right? Income. Everybody wasn't poor. Okay. 60% had at least a little bit of college education. All right. So it really is just to say, they were, and they were super young. Yeah, yeah young people. <laughs> All right, so, so those are the adults, right? Outcome. We asked people to respond to the statement on a Liger scale. How well do you feel? Well, the question is where I have a good understanding of how PCOR works. I have a good understanding of, of how comparative effectiveness research works. I was not expecting the outcomes that we got. Here you can see strongly agree as purple. A lot of people said they understand how patient-centered outcomes research works. And you also had a lot of neutral. Um, small disagree. And then strongly agree. So if you look at it, it looks like a little over half felt like they had some a good understanding. Same with, not so well, a slightly different. Maybe a little, little more, maybe a little under. This is strongly agree. I'm sorry, agree and strongly agree over here. From here to here is all affirmative, right? I have a good understanding about how CER works. Okay, now are they going to be able to go out and design a study? No, that's not the intent. The intent is for me to be able to go in and talk with folks and talk about these concepts and know that people are with me, right? That's the intent. The other things that I need to teach them, I can teach them. All right, then for our youth, we have 40 young people. Um, and you can see a little bit of the demographics with the young folks. More young ladies than young men. The vast majority of them identified as Christian. Okay? With the kids, it's a little different. Strongly disagree. I think that's my purple, purple, lavender, whatever. Or a neutral. Right? They didn't necessarily have as good an understanding. Okay? You see our numbers here? About 32% felt neutral about that. Um, and then felt neutral or agreed, about a quarter of each. I have a good understanding of how CER works. So we would have, but what did that tell me? That equips me and lets me know I have more work to do with the kids to help them get to the place I need them to be for this kind of work than with the adults. But the adults are the gatekeepers to the children. So if the adults understand at least on some conceptual level what we're doing, maybe that makes them more likely to work with me. Right? Maybe that means I can do better recruitment for the study. All right. So then it just we asked them how did they feel about working with us. Um, and this was just our member satisfaction survey, which I won't belabor. But I think most people felt like we did okay. Okay. All right. So let me go through just... Um, tell you what the main takeaways were from the focus group work that we did with these same folks. Um, that showed you demographic data for it. I'll pick one or two and then I'm going to stop because I want us to, you all to have an opportunity to ask me questions. All right, so what I will say about the focus group data analysis, we had four coders. Two were academics, me and my IRA, two were community partners. 
we taught them how to code data. They help code the data. So as we get this stuff published, they're co-authors. Probably a third of my publications since 2000, since I had a K, are with community partners as co-authors. There's one slide I took out, but I didn't have a lot of time to do it. Two of my community partners, one is a white woman who was a, <coughs> excuse me, has struggled with depressive illness all her life, very open about it. One was an African-American woman who's much older um, and retired with a PhD in education. They did a poster presentation at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. They have a big international meeting every fall. They helped design the poster. They, this was a different set of data. They helped code the data. They helped develop the questions. They helped do the qualitative interviews with the uh, participants in that particular study. They did the poster presentation. I stood off to the side. Right, so it's possible. To me, that's important. Right? There was this thing I was reading yesterday on Twitter by my Angelou. Not my Angelou. I'm sorry. Toni Morrison. I'm sorry. Um, and she, I don't, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right. But she said, your job is when you, the door is open for you and you get in, it's to turn around and open the door for somebody else. Right? When you get some power, your job is to turn around and empower somebody else. That's what we try to do. Right? That doesn't just benefit me. That benefits all of us. Because if you come to D.C. or you go to North Carolina where my partners are and you need some people to help you do some of your work, you have empowered communities that can participate. Right? Now, they don't ask you hard questions because they ask me hard questions. That part's not fun. Um, right? Especially when you start having discussions about budget. Right? That part's definitely not fun. But they're empowered to be able to do it. So anyway, for this data, I'll just show you what the takeaways were, what we learned from the focus groups. Um, and the focus of the focus groups is really around how do we empower and build capacity for African Americans and churches um, to do this kind of work around uh, mental health equity and reducing mental health disparities for black youth. So the main things that came out were mental illness obviously is stigmatized. They talked about from their perspective, church is a place to heal. They felt like, now this is from folks themselves, community folks. People need to feel like when they come into our spaces that the people they're working with understand them from a cultural perspective. They talked about validation of experience and acceptance and acknowledgement of mental illness within their own community, not for other folks, within our own community. So we'll just pick, we'll skip stigma because everybody knows it's stigmatized. All right, so we'll pick this, but they talk, the, th the theme basically talked about how people in churches, black churches, can use the mechanisms that already exist in the church to help open the conversation and reduce stigma around mental illness. Right, and this is just a quote. So one lady said, until I opened the Bible and asked God to show me those people that he called righteous, those people that he called strong, and I saw myself in them, and then she goes on to articulate how somebody specific, David, who's one of my favorite characters from the Bible. When I saw David, King David was depressed, it was the light bulb went off for her. It's like hundreds of thousands of years people have been dealing with this stuff. Right? So we talk about David and Goliath, but we don't talk about David looking depressed. And so for this group of people, and I'm not trying to prophesy because I'm Catholic, remember? Right? This, I don't, I'm not Baptist. So this, we have the same belief system, but we practice differently. I believe 45 minutes to an hour in and out of church, right? Baptists don't believe that. <laughs> My husband is Baptist. So on Sundays, we alternate. So one Sunday, we in and out of church in an hour. The other Sunday... <laughs> We're not in and out of church now. <laughs> All right. So the whole point is, I'm not suggesting to you that you not have to go convert. If you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, if you're Baha'i, you don't have to be of this faith. Matter of fact, one of my RAs is a practicing atheist. Is not a person of color. Oh, excuse me. Is not African American. She is a person of color. She's not African American. She was there when we were collecting this data. Right? That's not the point. The point is, is that it is a mechanism. It is a setting. You just have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Right? I can't tell you how long people have been trying to convert me to Baptist. Right? I'm telling you, older ladies and baby, now you know you over there with them Catholic. You know that ain't right. You need to come on home, baby. Come on over here with us. I've been hearing it for 20 years. I have not converted yet. Okay? So the point is just to say any of us can do this. I think it just takes a set of traits and a set of skills that allow us to go be in settings, right? What's one of those skills? The cultural competence. Just recognize it. All right. So finally, 
We're not going to go through all the focus group themes because we don't have a lot of time. We've got 10 minutes for you to ask questions. So I'm going to skip through them, but I'm happy to share the slides in case people have questions. All right? Then we had another project. I'm not even going to get into it. That was the project. This was the project from the lady that you saw earlier, Reverend Dr. Chase Sands. Um, had multiple tiers. We had the goal really was to build capacity. Honestly, the goal was to write a core proposal. All right, that was the goal. So I'm going to skip through all of this gobbledygook and just tell you what we did. What did we do with that? We submitted an application all right, where the partners were co-eyes, including Dr. Chase Sands. And as it happened, uh, the lady that I said earlier in the pink, she was also a co-eyed on that. I'm still with me here. Now, I'm pretty sure we didn't get funded because I already did the funding announcements, but I do think we got scored. So I have to wait and see what happens. All right, and then if we got scored, we'll put that sucker back in. All right, so finally, this is what partnership looks like. All right, again, all kinds of folks. Everybody's not just African American. Um, these are some giveaway things that the partners designed. These are bookmarks. This was their idea. They said, if somebody asks you, what are you doing as part of this stuff for Dr. Alfie, we need to give them something. So we said bookmarks, right, for obvious reasons, because it's youth. We want to encourage you to read, and so we give them a bookmark. We're sending subtle messages. This was all their idea. Right, and then remember how we started? We got folks in Mountain Pose. This was a retreat we did for the Engagement Award where we had about 30 folks, adults and youth, and this is where we did a lot of the training around CER, PCOR, um, CDPR, and uh, how you put together a research study. All right, so again, in closing, I'm saying to the young people and the young at heart, stay with your vision if you have a vision. Remember that there are people who came before you, like my grandma, who came before me, right? And so for some of you, I'm a little bit older. Um, I'm coming before you, so maybe your path will be a little easier. So if you want to do something, and people are looking at you like you have three heads, you say, no, uh I went to that lady, Doc, put it on me. That lady said, I should be able to pursue this. You need to help me figure out how I can do it, right? Okay, you got to say it in a nice way, because if you're a trainee, you don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> um, but... Stay with it, right? And so the final thing is two final messages I always want to say to folks. One is sometimes the most important trip you can take in life is meeting somebody halfway. Yes, those are my politics. I'm just going to own it, okay? <laughs> and finally, for all my sisters, don't ever forget this. She believed she could, so she did. And with that, I am done. Any questions or comments? And don't feel bad about leaving because I, I understand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. One thing that I noticed is that your three basic approaches on like how you're about four out of five people in the community. Right. And then when I don't have to apply to the top half, that's right. I'm curious to see if there's any evidence for any special characteristics about one out of five. I don't, you know, I think it's a, oh, my cousin is here. Everybody say hi to Kisa. This is the Kisa, my cousin. We are literally cousins. Our moms are sisters. And that lady I showed you, I showed them grandmother with her letter from uh, when she came back to um, Northwestern. Yeah, so that's our shared grandma. So anyway, I'm sorry. Um, so now you're nice and embarrassed, Kisa. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so basically, I don't know. I think that what people will often say, so the direct answer to your question is I don't know. So close that. So I answered it um, with a non-answer. But the bigger question is, people will often say that when I get grant uh, proposals back, that would be one of the criticisms. Well, you're not reaching everybody. And what I want to say, yeah, but I'm reaching more than what's currently in the literature, but I can't say that. <laughs> I can't say all that. So what I say instead is, yes, but you're reaching a larger segment, a more representative sample, and there are other places that people can be reached. So, right, the single largest provider for African-American, I would argue Latino men for mental health, is prison system. That's where they're getting their mental health care if they get any, right? That definitely is not reflective of the whole African-American Latino male population. So what I say is there are other pockets where you can probably reach people. That's just not my strength. Right? I'm not going to be able to do schools because it's too much bureaucracy. You know, I'm not working with homeless young people. I recognize where my the spots are where I'm not reaching people. But I don't know that anybody has looked at that question. You know, what is that one-fifth? Um, why are, how are they different? 
Um, I also don't know, I would say if I speculated, I would think sort of within that one fifth, probably black LGBTQ folks, right? Because the church has not always been a welcoming home for them, right? Um, but I don't know, but it's a great question. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering, when you first kind of started talking to me with the new purpose, I was wondering if you would tell me any education yeah. or maybe a Yeah. Yes. One hundred, every, every time I talk in communities, I get that, right? And so I think part of what is being honest with people is being up front and saying, look, I don't have all the answers. Um, I don't know all the questions, but I'm willing to. Remember I said I'm an academic, so I don't always listen. Part of it is going in and saying I'm willing to listen. That's one. And the other is my little joke about you need the papal blessing, right? Who's the papal blessing come from? The person in the community who has the clout. You have to find that person. That's the person who gets you, that, they open the door for you. So I, cold calling does not work, right? You've got to have, so I tell you a quick story. I know you got to go. Like I said, don't feel bad if you have to leave. I'm not, it's not going to offend me because I know how it is working in a, you know, hospital. And this is a work day. Um, I was talking to a person. I'm co eye on uh, this person's grant. And she was baffled. She's not a person of color. She was struggling with, I have this study. We've been recruiting people. We don't have any people of color in this study. And I said, well, what have you done? She said, well, we put an ad on a bus. <laughs> right, exactly. And I was like, I love her, so I'm going to be nice. Um, and that was all she could come up with. I said, okay, have you thought about fraternities and sororities? You're just trying to recruit. And she kept being stuck on, but I need them to be in walking distance. I said, why? She said, because people don't have transportation. I said, that's not true. That's a segment. Remember, where's her head? The segment of the population that she's seen in the literature that doesn't have transportation. I said, honey, if you, I said, let's write a letter, right? Let's write a letter and offer your services to some of these fraternities and sororities that have health weeks, right? The graduates, she, and then she was confused. She said, well, they're not an undergrad. I said, baby, let me give you education about black fraternities and sororities. When you graduate, it's not over. Like, in some ways, it's just getting started. And so it's that, like, she was having such a hard time because her framework was here. And I think it's that, you know, this speaks to the issue of you've got to have that sort of cultural broker. Now, if she would have asked me about Latinos, I wouldn't know, but I would know where to look, and I would know who to go ask and say, okay, look, what are the cultural organizations in Latino communities, right? So there's a, every, every city has El Centro Hispano, right? But that's one segment of that population, right? And then I'm thinking, okay, there's this huge National Hispanic Behavioral Health Society. Let's go talk to them. Do you know what I mean? There's like, uh, La, La Raza, right? There are these, these social act. Let's go talk to them. And so all of these people are always doing stuff. There's Latino churches. Let's go talk to them. And so it really is trying to open our framework a little bit, but the, the main point is you've got to have that cultural broker. The cultural broker is going to get you, and the cultural broker can vouch for you when people start hammering you about, well, y'all, you know, y'all researchers, y'all take, you don't give, and this helicopter, right? And they can say, no, 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 Dr. Alfie's cool. And sometimes that stops the whole, <laughs> all right? Yes, yes, sir. Chair. <laughs> this is Dr. Chair, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Um, so, um, I think it's the last one about acceptance of mental health and mental illness. Um, I'm just wondering where you think, or where you're getting it, that there, there's tragic and we're engaging in the community yeah. and identifying the stigma. Yeah. Kind of where, where do you think that there's an ability to. Uh, well, I've seen it, millennials. I'm, millennials, right? So you have this, all these, this proliferation of websites. You have these young people walking around with t-shirts saying therapy is dope. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not, nobody has done an epidemiological study to see how the beliefs have changed. But just anecdotally, it's millennials. I'm, I tell people often millennials are going to save us when it comes to this mental health stuff because they're so much more willing to talk about it. So you have lots of young people. There's this new website called uh, Therapy for Black Girls. This is adult stuff. Um, and there's two new apps for African American men in mental health where they're trying to help people get connected to providers. So I think in that sense there's traction, but also in the sense that I get requests, I'll probably get requests for talks two to three times a month. And when I go, you know, I didn't used to get that many requests for talks. Um, and then when I go, I see more and more young people of color present. 
so though anecdotally that's why I see there being sort of a sea change and then also in, in the media you have more and more famous folks. I work with young people so what's going to grab their attention? Celebrities. Right, whether it's what I think of, millennials, forgive me, a real celebrity, TV, you know, radio, or their celebrity, YouTube. I still can't grasp the concept of you a celebrity who put stuff on YouTube, but right, I'm old, I'm owning my stuff, I'm Gen X. And so you see these young people in these different settings talking about people needing to take care of their mental illness, sort of naming, like Jay-Z talking about the fact that people who come from communities like his, under-resourced communities, have experienced trauma. That was like 20 years ago, that was, just, that was life, right? It's community violence, this is how we grow up, it is what it is. But for somebody to label it and say, that's trauma, and you need to take care of yourself when you have experienced chronic trauma, chronic stress, that's where I see there being a difference. So it's not scientific, it's anecdotal, but for me, that's where I see it. All right. Thank y'all.